Welcome to another episode of Purchase to Profits. I'm Seth Ferguson. Make sure you hit the subscribe button so you don't miss our daily interviews with successful real estate investors. Our guest today has been investing in mobile home parks for almost two decades and is ranked at the fifth largest mobile home park owner in the United States with over 250 communities. Frank Rolf is the founder of Mobile Home University. Frank, welcome to Purchase to Profits. It's great to have you on the show. Great, thank you very much. Very happy to be here. Yeah, I'm, I'm really looking forward to uh, speaking with you. You've got a ton of experience in the space and I'm sure you have a couple good stories. Uh, uh, one or two at least, yes I do. <laughs> All right, so uh, to kick things off, tell us about your real estate goals. What, what do you wanna do now with real estate? Well, again, you know, real estate's been really good to me. I've been in it for about about 30 years now. Uh, and we're currently fifth largest in the U.S. We have no hopes or goal to become fourth, third, second, or first. Uh, we right now have about a billion dollars worth of mobile home parks. And to get to the next level up, we'd have to double yet again. So we're kind of happy right where we sit. Yeah. Uh, you know, we've been attracted from the onset to real estate for several reasons. Uh, one is we love the leverage aspect in our industry, particularly the seller financing aspect, which is unique. Uh, we also love the fact that in our little niche of mobile home parks, we're kind of recession resistant. So when th times are bad, we get better. When people are laid off in droves, they'll move into mobile homes. So our demand spikes. Uh, we like the security of it because our customers can't really move out. Uh, it costs about 5000 to move a home. So we like that attribute. So we're just big, just big real estate fans for many, many number of reasons. To get even more into the space as the economy's become rougher because simply it, it just makes our, our business better. Yeah. So right now, just where we're at in terms of the market cycle, are you saving up a bit of a war chest or what's your outlook? You know, we, we've never been capital constrained. Uh, so that's not really been the problem. We're not, we're not building a war chest to buy more properties. Uh, what, what, where we're at in our cycle of life is we're trying to add on properties that fit into our footprint geographically. So today we're looking for things that are more managerially efficient, I guess. But as far as rapid growth, you know, we've been buying mobile home parks at the rate in some years as much as one a week. So uh, it's not, it's not, that's not really our, our future. No, it's others' futures. There's many people out there growing their own portfolios right now, but sitting here is the fifth largest owner and the largest private owner, we're, we're, we're pretty happy just with that stature. Oh, I, absolutely. That's, that's certainly something to be proud of. Um, so what, what is it like scaling to a billion dollar business? Uh, I, I'm sure you had some different plateaus along the way. What was it like going from step to step to step? Sure. Well, I, I started out as did my partner, Dave Reynolds, with just one property. Uh, so I, I know what it's like to have just a single property, which I self-managed. I went out there every day and sat little trailer and managed it. Uh, probably the first initial step in scale happened when I got to my fifth property in Oklahoma, because at that point I had five different managers who would call me all the time. It was driving me nuts. So what I did was I re realized I needed somebody to be in between me and the managers who would take the calls late at night in the morning and save that constant phone ringing that was going on. So what I did was I hired an individual to be as the middleman named uh, D, D. And D basically, she was a retired apartment person. And she managed uh, all those properties and those managers for me. So I was no longer in the loop on that. And that was a real lifesaver. It was a life changer. Uh, once I had that, that was my first employee I ever had that was a, a buffer between me and the field, it made it a lot easier to grow. Now today, what we've done is we've scaled that same concept only at a much larger level. So now what we have is every property has a community manager, we call them a CM. And then groupings of CMs have a district manager, which is called a DM. And then groupings of the DMs have a regional manager, which is called an RM. So, but it's no different than me and D and the five parks only on a much larger scale. So since we have about 200 plus properties today, we have to have more of those insulators and those levels of management. But, but our industry is very scalable because the, the, what goes on in the field, traditionally in, in, a, in a perfect park, we own none of the homes. So all we're having to do is to manage, to make sure the utilities are working, the roads are free of potholes, that type of thing. So it's not really hard to scale up the management in our little niche per se, but that's, that's kind of how it worked. Yeah. And at what point did you add that extra level of management? Was it when things were going too crazy and, uh, you know, your, your head was spinning? 
Yeah, it, it, no, it, what happened was when I was trying to self-manage uh, properties in tandem with people who were on site who lived in them, they, they did not always have great judgment and they would call me at really ridiculous times. And often it wasn't because there was a problem, it was because they were lonely or they wanted some kind of affirmation they were doing a good job. So I would get calls from people 10 p.m., 11 p.m., 6 a.m. on a Saturday, Christmas Day, for no real reason. They'd always have a reason to call me. They'd always say, I, I think I see a dead tree limb up in the tree. What should I do? And of course, that's not really so urgent that you would need to call me uh, on Sunday at midnight. But what it really was, they, they were just kind of lonely and wanted to talk to somebody, or they wanted me to say, yeah, you're doing a great job. So that was where the management, that, that next level came in because it, it eliminated me from that duty. So those calls would then go to that person. And then anything that was critical, they would let me know what was going on. But that, that really gave me my life back because trying to self-manage five was really driving me nuts. Yeah. Well, you seem like a really nice guy. So maybe they just like to chat to you too. Well, you know, everyone in, in mobile home parks, they all have their own individual life stories. We have a lot, lot of uh, seniors on the payroll and different people. And sometimes they just get lonely like all people do. They want to call and talk to somebody. So I was, yeah, I was partially some kind of chat line or something, but it, it really wasn't important from a business perspective. Oh, absolutely. And what would you say was the big differentiating factor between yourself who's been able to scale up to a billion dollars versus the majority of people who get capped out at a certain level in this business? Yeah, I guess perhaps my partner and I are both a little, little mentally ill because we, we just like, like the, size, the size aspect and the growth aspect. A lot of people in the industry get happy and just stop after one or two properties. And I know other people who have little mini portfolios of maybe five properties or 10. I can't give you an actual tangible reason why we didn't stop there, but maybe we're lacking the, the whatever gland in your body stops you from continually working endlessly, but that's what we do. So today to maintain the portfolio, I drive about 100,000 miles a year. And my partner, who who does a lot of a lot of the back office and the accounting issues and things like that, you know, he he probably works at least eighteen hours a day, and that and that is the punishment you get for growing to our size. So, but would I recommend it for most people? No, not unless it really is important to you to to want to do that. And would you call yourself a deal junkie? Do you like doing the deal? Is that what appeals to you? You know, that's a great question. Uh, I think what happens is. Once you buy the first property and the second, the third, and the fourth, and the fifth, at some point you realize that you've got this level of expertise that you've developed, and then you feel like it's a waste to not use it more, right? So that, I think that's why you see so many professional athletes who end up commentators on TV, because they think, well, if I stop thinking about football or talking about football, then what was the point of learning everything about football? We're no different. So basically, yes, we are. We are I think we're more than deal junkies. We're kind of industry junkies. Because after you learn everything, you feel like it's your duty to, to continue on with that and to explain it to people. So that's what's happened. Yeah. And at what point did you start sourcing outside capital from investors? Uh, was it, did you do your first couple deals and then start raising money? Yeah, we did all of our early deals with our own capital. At some point in anyone's movie, you realize that you either have a big opportunity or you don't. And if you don't have a big opportunity, you don't need to, to create any additional capital because you can handle it yourself. But if you feel like the opportunity is large, then you go out and get outside capital. And that's what happened with us. So we, we, we realized in 2010 that the opportunity was so giant, so vast in our industry that it, it was going to outstrip all of our capital. Yet we thought people would want to want to share in the adventure. And so that's why we started doing that. Yeah. And what challenges did you have when you first started raising that money? Did you have any speed bumps? You no, know, we, did, we didn't really have any challenges. We, we, we did Reg D 506 construction like many people are doing. Uh, and I think because we lucked into the fact that the affordable housing debate in America has become a big deal, right? When we got in the industry in the mid 90s, no one knew what the word affordable housing even meant. Nobody cared at all about mobile home parks or mobile homes. So it would be really hard back then to probably fundraise. People would say, why would I invest in those old nasty trailer parks? Screw them. Who cares? Now it's different. People realize that it's a huge problem in America, therefore a huge opportunity. Uh, almost everyone knows the product. That's the one nice thing about mobile home parks. Unlike other things in life, no one knew at the time what a smartphone was or a fax machine. Everybody knows trailer parks, whether good or bad, from the media, from driving around, from just growing up. You know what a trailer park is, so it's a very easy commodity. You either, you either think they're fascinating, you think they're dreadful, 
And there's a lot of people who think they're fascinating in a world where America is getting poorer every day. So, but it really was not an issue for us. In fact, there's, there's many other people who have Reg D funds out there, and I don't think it's been a big problem for them either. It's just, this is a, it's a hot topic right now. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, you mentioned how many miles you drive per year. Uh, you're, you're really busy with the scale you have. Uh, do you have any routines or rituals that you have that helps keep you focused? Well, yeah, I have a lot of, lot, lot of rituals, both daily, weekly, and monthly. One thing I do is every day, the day before, I take a, a, a legal pad, eight and a half by 11. I only use white paper, not yellow. I've been doing the same thing for 30 years now. I have a flare pad, which I like from the 70s. Uh, so I buy bulks of them, and I, and I make a little roadmap of my next day. So it is titled on the top. It'll say today whatever the date is. And then I have the first section says trip one. I don't know why it says trip one. It said trip one always. And then I have another section called calls. And I lay out my entire day on that sheet of paper, every minute of the day, what I'm supposed to be doing as far as meetings or drivings. And then all my calls are all my most important calls. I then carry that around with me. And so I'm highly efficient all day because every day I know exactly what I'm supposed to be doing. And then the next day before the, the end of the day, before I go to bed, I, I lay out the next day. So that's been one ritual that's kept me out of trouble for a long time. I also keep lots and lots of lists. I carry a huge, in fact, here, here's my list. I just came back from the road. I'll show this to you. I just got back from a 20 hour drive. This is, these are my wow. lists. Okay. So I carry those with me everywhere I go. And while I'm driving everywhere I stop, if I stop at the hotel, I have all my lists of everything I need to be doing. In every, in every front, I have lists for occupancy, collections, property condition, you name it. I have it, household items, and I just work from these lists. I have two highlighters, a blue and a yellow. The things that, are, that I feel are not advancing fast enough, I give a yellow highlighter, which means hurry up and do something with it. As I complete things, I cross them with a blue highlighter. That's as simple as it is. I know it's horrifying to those in the computer era that you have idiots like myself still using those old-timey methods, but that's what I'm used to. Yeah. And there must have been something that happened to cause you to create those lists. Um, was it a matter of your first couple deals, you not having those systems in place that prompted you to become well, more organized? Well, I always use, which I have laid here, I've always used a day timer. Okay. So the day timers are something I've always had laying around. And the day timer has been a huge help to me to keep my time organized. But the problem is the day timer itself is somewhat limited, right? The the, the area is not very big to ride on. It's, you know, it's a, like a, like a two inches wide each column. So the, the lists, you know, they, they allow me to, you know, write out in, in, in large scale what I'm doing and therefore it's, it's, it's just easier. So I'm just happy with all those different lists. I always have a concern about forgetting that one important item. I think that's the other part of the problem. So I'm always, you know, gosh, I don't want to forget that, that critical thing for the day that I'll kick myself over. And by having these lists, I don't have to worry about my memory. That's the other big part. Yeah. Well, especially when you have so many moving pieces, it's so easy to forget, to, uh, forget something. Well, that, that, that's just it. Again, when you're driving, your driving is distracting enough. So when you're driving around, you're trying to like, you know, pay attention to where you go and I have a GPS, but you don't have an accident. So when you, when you take driving and add another, another task onto that, it makes it tough. So yes, the, the pad gives me this feeling of security that I know where I am all throughout the day. So I don't screw up. Another habit I have is that whenever I have a conference call, such as this, this thing we're doing now, I, I set up a timer on my phone. So 10 minutes before every important item of the day, my phone rings, which means up oh, time to get ready for the next item. And that way I, I don't miss things. I'm always, I'm always terrified I'm going to miss something. Yeah. Okay, gotcha. And uh, looking at all the deals you've done, is there one that stands out as a keystone deal that made a big impact? You know, yes, the deal, my, my keystone deal would be my very first deal uh, called Glenhaven uh, down in Dallas. I, I, I bought the property for $400,000 with 10,000 down. And the guy carried the paper for 30 years. That was what got me in the business. I would never have the guts to do it if that had not occurred. After I got that property, I learned everything from that property. I officed in it for a full year from nine to five. I learned everything about mobile homes, the customers, how they work, the problems and everything. So had I not devoted that year on site, I might, I might not have had the confidence to grow like I did. Yeah. Right. But that would be my key, my keystone deal. Uh, without, without question, you know, I sold, I sold that deal years later for a million five. So about a million dollars more than I paid for it. Uh, today it's worth, you know, I'm sure it's worth far, far more. I, I, when I sold it, the rents, I think in Dallas have almost doubled from when I sold it. 
but nevertheless, that would be my most important deal, I think, because it, that, that got me in the industry. I learned a ton. The deal itself turned out very successfully. So that was probably my most important deal as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. And, and the seller carried the financing. So lots of people um, that watch this show, uh, they're just getting started in real estate and uh, sure. they don't really understand or maybe they feel that having a seller carry financing is out of their reach. What tips would you give them for bringing up that conversation? Okay, well, the, it, the seller financing right now is extremely attractive for everybody because interest rates, as you know, are terrible. So when you give a seller cash, he goes to A.G. Edwards and says, I want to invest this. And they say, how much risk do you want? He says, none. They say, I can get you roughly 2.5% in, in a treasury, right? Yeah. Uh, however, we pay in our seller carries 5 up to 6%. So they're doubling their money. There's no additional risk to them, really. Uh, and there's tax benefits because when you carry, you don't pay any tax until you actually receive the principal. So you get interest on that, which you would have already paid out in tax. Uh, and, it's, and it's really a safer investment for them. If, you know, what happens to a lot of these people is they realize they can't live on the two and a half percent treasury. So the stockbroker says, well, I have some junk bonds from John Deere. They're paying six. And if you look at John Deere junk bonds versus owning the mobile home parks debt, it's, it's, it's a night and day difference, right? My, my, the worst case scenario, mom and pop, if I default, they take the park back. They already know it. They've already run it. They can resell it. Worst case with John Deere, they have a big pile of paper, which is worthless, which they yeah. can use to make into wallpaper or something, but it has no material gain at all. Yeah. So that's why people do it is right now. It just makes sense. Now, back when CDs were paying 10%, you know, seller carry would have been a whole lot harder, but now with quantitative easing and low interest rates, it's a whole much easier sell. Yeah. And in, in that case, the, the parks are going after now, do you target uh, mom and pop operations where they may yes. want to do that seller carry? Yeah. 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 So you, know, you have to know this about our industry. It's so strange because we're so unconsolidated. There's 44,000 parks in the U.S. There's only 4,000 that are institutionally owned, which means that they're professionally owned. So we have 40,000 40, out of the 44 that are still the wild frontier. And those are the folks who do seller carry. So that's why there's so much seller carry going on in our industry. Yeah. And you know, coming in from an institu institutional side, you're coming in with that professional management, all the systems. So you're able to even, uh, you know, you're able to uh, uh, reduce the expenses and yes. improve operational and, and all that. That's correct. Correct. I mean, the, 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 f the four big things that, that happens when the institutional buyer buys it from mom and pop traditionally is obviously you raise the rents, you fill the lots up, you cut the cost and number one cost would typically cut is the on-site manager because often mom and pop are massively overpaid. We bought properties where the on-site manager was making over a hundred thousand a year and we replaced them with people making 25 and 30. Yeah. And the last item is sub meter the water sewer. That's, that's a big item. A lot of people are doing mom and pop never sub metered. People never paid for what they use. They don't care about conservation at all. They'll, they'll let the hose blow full blast all summer and the water bills are insane. We've, we've bought properties where the water sewer bill is running 150 per lot. And we put it in some meters and it suddenly drops down to 50. And that hundred dollars is literally just lost forever because uh, people, when they don't, when they don't pay for what they use, they don't care. Yeah. Uh, do you foresee that institutional uh, market share uh, growing over the next, uh, let's say yes. five, 10 years? Yeah. Yeah. So there, there's a, there's a, been a lot of consolidation going on in the industry right now. It's at the very highest end. So all of your really large properties uh, there, let, let's just go over the current entrance. You had three, $2 billion transactions about two and a half years ago. Uh, you had Sun, which is a public REIT in the US, bought up uh, Carefree. And then you had uh, Northstar, also known as RHP, which sold to Brookfield, a Canadian REIT. And then you had uh, Yes Communities, which is the number four position, sold to uh, the country of Singapore uh, through GIC, which is their Singaporean uh, fund that the country owns. Uh, then in recent times, you had the Carlisle Group, which is the largest, uh, largest private equity group in America. They have started buying parks. They didn't buy just a group. They actually been buying them one, one after the other. They're 5,000 lots. You had Apollo Group buy up uh, someone this past year. So really, all of your large private equity groups are now in the game, uh, circling around. But they're still buying most of the high-end, big, really valuable stuff. They've not worked their way down into the, the typical park. Yeah. And, and would you say that's a, that's a result of compressed uh, cap rates in other uh, types of real estate assets? Like, uh, you know, yes. yeah. Yeah. In, in part, a lot of these guys, bear in mind, come out of the space of uh, both apartment and single family. Right. So like Blackstone is a huge player in single family. They've not bought, to my knowledge, any mobile home parks yet, but they've definitely show up at all the conventions. Yeah. But 
uh, yeah, it, it, what part of it is the cap rate compression and part of it is just the narrative of affordable housing, right? I mean, the average apartment rent in the U.S. is 1,200 and something a month and our average lot rent in a mobile home park is 280 a month. So they're doing the math and saying, man, when things really, really get bad in the years ahead in the U.S., uh, people can't afford 1,200 and something. But they sure can afford 280 and there's a lot of room to grow the 280 rent up to four or $500. So yes, that, that's why they're going there. Yeah. And uh, so how has real estate changed your life since you've started building your business? Well, you know, it, 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 I, I've been in it almost from the beginning. I got out of uh, Stanford a year early, jumped right into the billboard industry, which is a very unusual alternative segment of real estate. So I've always been in it. It's obviously changed my life because I made lots of money at it and had a lot of fun doing it. Yeah. Uh, so I can't really fathom what else I would be in, to be honest with you. I don't really ever think, yeah, I think I should have been a, I don't know what, other career, a car dealer. I don't know what, yeah. no, I mean, it's, I pretty much just a real estate person. So yeah. I can't really pinpoint exactly how, what the differences are. Cause I don't know what the differences might've been otherwise. So I don't really have a story where I was working a normal day to, you know, a nine to five job and said, wait a minute, I like real estate better. Cause I never did a nine to five job. So I've only been just doing the same crazy thing now for, for about three decades. Yeah. And how do you see your business uh, shifting and growing over the next couple of years? Uh, do you have a plan and end vision in mind? Yeah, I think what you're going to see in our business, at least, is we're, we're very attuned to the fact that as our lot rents get higher, we have to do more to give it a good value. So a lot of the times now when we're looking at these properties, we're not looking at how to expand the, the money aspect. We're not looking and saying, wait, can we stick another mobile home lot in there or something? Now we're looking at the same parcel and saying, can we stay, make that into a playground? Right. I just came back from uh, two or some properties we have in Michigan. We're looking at converting a laundry building into a clubhouse. We're looking at uh, converting a grassy area, possibly to a splash pad. So that that's the future. I mean, our, our industry has been forgotten by the average investor for decades and decades, and there hasn't been a lot of thought. And initially, no matter what you did, you couldn't go wrong when the rents were down in the hundreds and two hundred dollar range. Now that rents are pushing into the threes and fours and fives, and in Denver the sevens, and in California the thousands, you know you have to give back more back. And you're all the time looking at your park and saying, "What can I do to make people happier here? How can I use this better? How can I use that better?" So we're so I think right now it, the big theme is probably the efficiency of the asset itself. How can we utilize every inch of this property? to some constructive purpose. Every, every little green space, every unused lot, let's get picnic tables, let's put in fire pits, let's do something. Let's take that grassy field, let's mow it and put soccer goals in it, whatever the case may be, because you know that's, that's it. We're all trying to figure out how to, get a, how to eke out the best value from the property for the resident. That's been, the, I'd say, probably one of the big shifts. Yeah. And how would you suggest if somebody's out there watching this right now and they're, they're ready to make the jump into acquiring their first property, uh, what advice would you give them? Okay. Well, I'd give them the, the key item, I think, which is true of all, all real estate. You got to really know what you're doing. You got to learn. You got to be a voracious reader. You need to like check everything out and tell you how I have enough competence uh, to understand what you're doing. It's not, it's not smart to risk your capital in it. So, I mean, e even today, I'm a voracious studier and learner of all other different sectors. I'm always looking for ideas in other real estate sectors I can use in ours. I went to the apartment show last year. I'm always reading on single family operators. I even wa read war strategy books because I'm always looking for that one new idea that's somehow a game changer. But when you're first starting out, the, the most dangerous thing you can do is not to know what you're doing. I mean, Benjamin Franklin said that diligence is a mother of good luck. I don't know if he was a real estate investor or not. I assume he owned a little house back in 1776, but that is, that is still the, the correct theme. I mean, you, you want to basically eliminate risk and you do that through knowledge. It's, it's something that's been quoted a million times from Warren Buffett to Sam Zell, but that, that's really the key. So if you want to get in it and do well, you've got to be a studier, a learner, a listener, really understand what you're doing. Yeah, that's a good tip. Uh, so Frank, if somebody's looking to learn more about uh, your company and yourself, where can they find you online? Well, you know, we have this weird, weird thing. It's like we have, we have a, a dual life here. Our hobby is, again, our industry. So our, our day job is the, the mobile home parks we own. Our hobby is a thing called MHU.com. Uh, we started it about, I don't know, 10 or 20 years ago. Uh, initially, as an outlet that we would write little books about our daily adventures in mobile home park land, seeing if any other operators wanted to read those and or submit interesting books back to us. Kind of like one of these uh, movies like Omega Man, where you're not sure if anyone even cares out there. So 
you know, we had this website, not much going on, and we would write these little crazy books, and people would say, ooh, yeah, I read your crazy book, write another little crazy book, and which is what we did, uh, and over time, that became a course, and ultimately, even a boot camp, but that, that's kind of our hobby, so when I'm not out there in our own parks, I'm talking to other people who either are buying or already own their parks and what they're doing, and we learn a lot from that. I mean, we get ideas from other people out there in the greater sphere all the time. So that's, that's our hobby. So I guess we're 100% since our, since our day job and hobby are both the same industry. That's about it. You can find me, everything I ever wrote, well, almost all the content on there is free. My phone number's on there. My email's on there. If you just go to mhu.com, you, you, can't, you can't find not enough on there. There's a ton of stuff on there. Uh, that's great. Well, Frank, I just want to say thanks so much for taking the time today and sharing your success with us. Well, you bet. Well, thanks for having me. Uh, no one enjoys talking about the industry more than me. So yeah. you know, glad to be here. <laughs> yeah, but pleasure was mine. And uh, to you, our reviewers, I wish you well in your journey from purchase to profits. See you next time.